This is a short video I'm making to demonstrate a method I devised for measuring waveform update rates on DSOs without uh, a trigger output. It's quite simple to do and it doesn't require any special equipment, although you will have to have some kind of a source for a sine wave or a square wave that's variable. First I wanted to look at a typical diagram of an acquisition cycle of a DSO. Uh, you can see it's broken into four basic sections here. Uh, the first one is the ac actual acquisition period, which is, of course, started by the reception of some kind of a trigger. And then the acquisition time itself, which is based either on the time base setting and the number of divs or sample length, which, whichever happens to be longer in real time. And then you've got your blind time period, which is actually two sections, the fixed blind time, which is always the same. Doesn't matter about any settings or sample lengths on your DSO. And then you've got the variable blind time, which can vary based on time base, sample length, you know, features you happen to be using, number of channels you're running, and so forth. Okay, that's obvious. And then after those periods, you've got what I would call your wait time, where the DSO is finished with the acquisition cycle and it's waiting for the next trigger. Now, as is probably apparent from this, or most people know anyway, in the minimum acquisition cycle time from that point to that point is the inverse of the waveforms per second. Obviously, the DSO cannot respond to another trigger. After it receives the first one and starts the acquisition, it's not going to respond to any other triggers until this point here. Okay, so let's take a look at a few acquisition cycles in a row. So, um, in this diagram, all of these downward pointing lines are triggering events. And in this particular diagram, they're occurring rather randomly. Starting here, the DSO gets a trigger, it starts the acquisition cycle, but in the middle of that, during the blind time, there's a trigger that happens, and so that trigger is ignored. It gets to the end of the acquisition cycle, then it's waiting, 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 it gets to the next trigger, goes through another cycle, wait period, trigger, same thing, same thing. And then down here again, before it finishes the blind time, it has a trigger which again is ignored. So it enters after that period, enters a wait period, and then another trigger. So um, this is with just random triggers coming in, you see that uh, the acquisition cycle time is varying in length, and so then also are the waveforms per second. Now the normal way that you measure the waveform update rate of a DSO is you use the trigger output, and since uh, you don't know when you're starting what the waveform rate would be. You want to send in uh, a repetitive, very high frequency trigger so that you make sure that you re trigger the DSO as quickly as possible when that acquisition cycle time is ended. So you notice in this diagram that, uh, again, the red lines are the accepted triggers, the black ones are the ignored ones. The triggers are coming in so fast that every time, just when it reaches the end of its blind time, the next trigger is there. So you basically, when you attach a frequency counter to the trigger output of the DSO and you measure the frequency of these red accepted triggers coming out, you'll get the waveforms per second. Of course, this method is quite easy as long as you have a trigger output, but many DSOs don't have those, especially the lower cost ones. So I wanted to come up with a method that was usable, simple for the DSOs that don't. So instead of trying to trigger the DSO as quickly as possible to get an idea of the minimum acquisition cycle time that way, I decided to take the opposite approach. So imagine that you have a waveform coming in that's slowly increasing in frequency. So the period of the waveform is getting smaller and the triggers are occurring more quickly. You can see in the diagram that the wait period is slowly decreasing because of that. At some point, the triggers are going to hit the blind time and the DSO is going to be blind to them. It's going to ignore them. So we just have to know when that is. So that was the trickiest part of coming up with this whole technique was trying to figure out a way to recognize when the DSO was missing triggers when you don't have a trigger output and you have a continual sequence of incoming triggers. So thinking about this more, it came to me that I really need to be concerned with basically two triggers. So if this first trigger in the series is a zero, and this is a one, and then it's a zero again, and then a one, and a zero, and a one, and a zero, and if you imagine this sequence continuing on past this point, you'll realize that as the frequency increases, the zeros will start landing in the blind times, but the ones will continue to trigger the DSO. So 
if there is a square wave coming in like this, or it can be a sine wave, it doesn't matter, you'll notice that all the rising edges are on the zeros and all the falling edges are on the ones. And if I set my DSO to trigger on both slopes, rising and falling, what's going to happen is when I start hitting line times by increasing the frequency, an edge is going to disappear from the DSO screen. Now in this particular example, it's the rising edge which would all of a sudden disappear from the DSO screen. And all subsequent rising edges would be invisible and you, you won't see them until the incoming waveform reaches this frequency. At which point, when the second falling edge starts hitting blind times, it means subsequently rising edges will re-trigger the scope again. So as soon as you see the rising edge reappear again, you know that you've reached the minimum acquisition cycle time or the waveforms per second. So using this technique, I ran some tests on my Rigel DS2000, which was handy because I could compare my results against uh, the trigger output results. So in this chart, you see um, the numbers that are in black are measurements I made some time ago very quickly using the trigger out of the Rigel. And these numbers here in colors are the results I got using this technique. Um, unfortunately, I don't have another DSO to test this on, so I'm hoping that some of the people listening to this will try it on their DSOs that don't have trigger outs and report the results, especially you uh, Rigel DS1000 owners and perhaps you Hantech DSO5000 owners as well. You'll notice if you compare the list that the technique is quite accurate. It's not perfect, but it's uh, more than enough in order to give you an idea of what your DSO is doing at each time base setting given a certain sample length. You'll notice also that this group of numbers is broken into red and blue. I just did that to indicate that with the blue numbers it was very easy to locate the blind time and to figure out the waveform per second rate, but with the red ones it was a little trickier and I think that's because below 5 microsecond per division setting the active ac acquisition time on the Rigel is less than 50 microseconds and it it gets trickier to locate that that little window. You'll see when I demonstrate the technique. The first thing we want to do is make sure that our trigger settings are correct. So I'm going to the trigger menu. Um, I'm going to be using channel 1 for measuring, so that's the source. Uh, we want to use edge triggering. We want it to trigger on both slopes, so I'm going to switch that. And we want to make sure we're going to be sweeping in normal mode, so I'm going to select that. We're starting this demonstration at the 5 millisecond per div setting. On the Rigel, there's 14 divs, so that means the normal acquisition time at this setting is 70 milliseconds. Since that goes into one second, uh, less than 15 times, we know that we can't have more than 15 waveforms per second. So I'm starting with a square wave set to 10 hertz, and you can see I'm only triggering on the leading edge, the rising edge, so I, I must be in the dead time. Now I'm going to start raising the frequency which will of course shorten the period so let's go 11 it's 12 13 14 and now you see we're double triggering so this is the waveform update rate for the 5 millisecond per division setting now I'm going to go to the next fastest time base setting which will be two milliseconds. You see we're double triggering but we still have to find the blind time first and then get through that in order to find the real waveform update rate. So I'm going to start raising the frequency until we hit the blind time. There, we've, we're in the blind time. I'm going to keep raising it now I'm up to 19, up to 20, 23, 24, 26, 27, 28, 30, 33, 34, 35, oh, there we go, 35.2 you see. Anyway, let's say 35 roughly. So there's the waveform update rate for 2 milliseconds of division. So that demonstrated manually raising the frequency of a square wave to find the blind time and then to work through it 
to find the actual waveform update rate. And that works fine at any settings where you only have a couple of dozen waveforms per second, but it's rather tedious when you're looking for an amount that's up in the hundreds or thousands. So here's a quicker method for doing it. Um, I've got a sine wave I'm going to sweep from 20 hertz to 1500 hertz. I'm at the 50 microsecond setting right now on the Rigol, so watch the frequency counter as I do this. So we're sweeping up, there's both edges. Up, oh, one edge has disappeared. We're in the blind time, we're waiting until we pass through that. And now it's back and we're right around 1300 hertz. So 1300 hertz is about the waveform update rate at this time base setting. Here we are at the 20 microsecond time base setting and we're going to do the same thing. This time we're going to sweep up until 3.5 kilohertz. So keep an eye on the counter. Waiting for the edge to vanish. Yep, there it goes. We're in the blind time. Want to watch for when we come out of it again. There we are. So we're about 3 kilohertz is the waveform update rate at this setting. So just to give you an idea of what's actually happening, I've got the fluke here hooked up to the trigger output so that it's counting the waveform update rate so we can look at what's happening on the screen relative to that. So I haven't reached the blind time yet and if I start to raise the frequency, the frequency of the sine wave at this moment is 1440. So you can see that the trigger output is 2880, exactly double that since we're triggering on both the rising and falling edges. As I start to raise this towards the blind time, you'll see that the trigger output, the rate goes up a little higher. As soon as we're going to hit the blind time, you'll see what happens. Again, all of a sudden it halves the waveform update rate, it drops down to the actual frequency of the sine wave, which is at 1522 right now. And as I start to uh, increase the frequency some more, again, now the waveform update rate continues to rise again. We're going to climb very high real quickly, 2100. 792 or 2985. We haven't found our way out of the blind time yet, but we're just about to. You see we're at 3007 hertz. And as soon as we get out of the blind time, you see our waveform update rate drops back down again. So it's that cusp right before I back it up a little. just off that. It's actually the, just the end of the blind time is where we actually have our highest waveform update rate. But for all intents and purposes we can call it exactly where we get out of the blind time. It's more or less the same thing in terms of our frequency of our sine wave. The last thing I wanted to demonstrate is what I mentioned before in that as you work with the smaller time based settings the acquisition cycle window is smaller and so it becomes not as obvious as it was in the earlier demonstrations to locate the blind time. You're looking instead of for an obvious edge vanishing and then re reappearing much later, you're looking just for a flickering which will give you an indication of where that blind time window is. So here I am at the one microsecond per division setting and I'm going to sweep a sine wave from 4 kilohertz to 6 kilohertz because I know in this case that the waveform update rate, the blind time window is within that range. If I didn't I'd be I'd be starting by sweeping from a very low range, 10 hertz, 20 hertz or something, up to a higher one until I started recognizing the flickering, which is the telltale sign of the blind time window. And then I could narrow my search and slow my sweep down. So And there's our flickering as we pass through the blind time. It happened right around 5.2 kilohertz, so that's a very good approximation of what the waveform update rate is at this time-based setting. Here's an example at the 50 nanosecond. 
time-based setting that gives an example of what we're looking for at these with these shorter acquisition cycles instead of a, a clear-cut edge disappearing and then coming back later we're looking for this flickering this flickering indicates we're in the blind time at the moment I happen to be at 24 kilohertz right now so if I raise the frequency manually at some point both edges will be approximately the same brightness Just, that's pretty close I'm at about 24.8 kilohertz and now we've, we know our waveform update rate at this setting so this is the final example I, I'm at the 10 nanosecond time base setting and I want I'm going to sweep from 5 kilohertz up to 12 kilohertz so this is uh, sweeping with 10, 10 hertz steps, 10 milliseconds per step. So it's going to be rather fast, but you should be able to see the flickering to indicate the, the general area where the blind time is. So we're going up. There's one trace, there's a second trace, and that was the area of the blind time. It happened to be around the 9 kilohertz range. So I'm going to narrow that band and sweep some more. So now I'm going to sweep from 9 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, this time slower, so I can see precisely when the flickering ends to get a pretty good indication of the waveform update rate at this time base setting. So we're waiting for the flickering to happen. There it goes, it's beginning. going now we're stable again at 9.4 kilohertz that's the waveform update rate so hopefully this will be enough to get people uh, testing this method out on DSOs without trigger outputs and uh, if you have any questions uh, let me know and please uh, if you get some results maybe you can post them